Well, we do welcome everyone this morning to our webcast. We welcome you in the Saviour's name. Thank you very much for uh, joining with us today as we come before the Lord, sing his praises and come around his word. For those from our own congregation here in Newton Abbey, we give you a special welcome. Also those from our Tyndale uh, congregation, I'm inter-moderator uh, there. So we welcome uh, all in the Saviour's name and wherever you are joining in uh, this morning, we pray the Lord will bless us and draw near to us. We're going to turn to the Psalms and commence with Psalm 116. I love the Lord because my voice and prayers he did hear. I, while I live, will call on him who bowed to me his ear. Psalm 116, I'm going to sing the first eight verses and then uh, down at the end of the Psalm 17, 18 and 19. Those last uh, verses we will sing as well. So it's Psalm 116, verses 1 to 8, and then 17 to 19. They'll come up on the screen, and you'll be able to join in as we praise the Lord. together in prayer 
and wait upon the Lord and seek his face. Our God and Father, we do bow before thee in the Saviour's worthy name, that name that is above all others. And we thank thee we come in the name of one who is indeed risen today from the dead. We thank thee that he's not upon a cross, nor is he in the tomb. But he is alive, he is risen, he is ascended. We thank thee that he is at thy right hand, a prince and a saviour. And we know that he's coming again in power and great glory. And Lord, one day we shall see him, uh, for we shall be with him. We shall be like him. And we thank thee this day for all thy mercies to, to us and for the opportunity to draw near to thee. And Lord, though we be separated one from the other and not in the house of God, uh, yet, Lord, we thank thee in spirit we can come together. And we come as those of like precious faith. We thank thee, Lord, for that which we do have in common, one with the other. That we are those who are believers in Christ Jesus. We have the experience of the new birth. That work of regeneration has been wrought in our soul by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank thee there's been a time when we passed from death to life and from the power of Satan unto God. And we come, therefore, as those who are alive in the spiritual sense. Lord, not just physically alive, but Lord, we thank thee that we're alive spiritually too. There's new life in our soul, and that new life desires communion with God. It must have communion with God. It's, it's, it's uh, our very life breath, O oh Lord, in the spiritual sense, that we draw near and fellowship with thee and commune with thee. And we pray that thou will bless us today as we do so. As we sing thy praises, as we will come around the word of God, we pray that we might know the sense of the Lord today drawing near. O oh Lord, speak to us, we pray. Work in our hearts, minister by thy Holy Spirit to us. We thank thee that uh, he is under no restrictions at all. Lord, we may be hindered from coming to the house of God and many other restrictions laid upon us at this time. But we thank thee the word of God is not bound. And Lord, the, the word can run in a free course. The Holy Spirit is at work and none can hinder him. And therefore we pray, Lord, come to us today wherever we are and minister to our own souls. And may we rejoice in thee, make us glad in the Lord. Like those disciples when it was said of them, then were they glad when they saw the Lord. And may we see him today with the eye of faith. And may our hearts rejoice in him for all that he is and all that he has done for us. Lord, we thank thee for every mercy, for thy preserving hand upon us, keeping us to this hour, and we commit ourselves afresh to thee. Lord, we need thee, and we pray that we might know thy good hand upon us. Watch over us, and all are going out and coming in, or rising up and lying down. May we know the hand of the Lord upon us, and we ask that you'll meet every need, encourage every heart. Lord, those today who uh, maybe feel the weariness of the journey, maybe feel the loneliness of it, in being on their own and cut off from others and from the people of God. And we pray that thou will minister to them and may thy good hand be upon them. And may they know the Lord coming by. Grant them that sense of the Lord's nearness that they might know it at their, at their very hand stands the Lord. And we pray that thou will bestow thy blessing. Thou art the one that commands uh, the blessing, even life forevermore. So Lord, command the blessing today. And rejoice our hearts, we pray. Speak to all. We think of those who may, are, may be listening in and they're unsaved, they're unconverted. They're not the children of God. They've never come to Christ, never felt their need of him, never felt themselves to be sinners in need of a saviour, never been brought to that place where they've been broken over their sin and sorrowed over their sin. Lord, we pray that thou would work uh, salvation in their hearts. Oh, we pray that they might realise there is indeed a need to seek Christ, that he is the only saviour. There is no other uh, name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, that he alone is the only saviour. And we pray that they will be brought to that place where they will cry out uh, to him and call upon him to save their soul. May that even be so today. Remember all who are led aside, those who are sick. Think of those who sorrow, Lord, even through these times and uh, as well through other circumstances uh, at the present time, we pray for families that have been bereaved that I would draw near and comfort hearts, minister to them, we pray. Grant them the comfort of God, Lord, in the midst of all of their trials and the dark valley that they seem to be called to walk through. We pray that 
they might find the Saviour to be the one who draws alongside and who speaks words of comfort and cheer to them. So, Lord, abide with us, we pray now. Uh, Speak to our hearts as we continue on before thee, for we pray in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn uh, just now. It's number 153 in the hymnal. Our Lord is now rejected and by the world his own, by the many still neglected and by the few enthroned. But soon he'll come in glory. The hour is drawing nigh, for the crowning day is coming by and by. It's 153. Do join in as you see the words coming up on the screen. going to read the word of God and today we're turning to 2 Samuel chapter 15 and we want to read from verse 13 of this chapter and we will read down to the end of this portion. So 2 Samuel chapter 15, it's continuing on to uh, deal with the conspiracy that arose around Absalom in his rebellion and how they turned upon David and sought to overthrow him as king. And we want to come to think about that matter again uh, today. So we're reading from 2 Samuel chapter 15, and it's verse 13. And there came a messenger to David, saying, 
The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. And the king went forth, and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him, and all the Carathites, and all the Pelathites, and all the Gittites, six hundred men, which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then said the king to Etai the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place, and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Seeing I go whither I may return thou, and take back thy brethren, mercy and truth be with thee. And yet I answered the king, and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my soul the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. And David said to it, I go and pass over. And it I the Giddite passed over, and all his men, and all the little ones that were with him. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And Lo Zadok also and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God. And Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. If I shall find favour in the eyes of the Lord... He will bring me again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him do to me also seemeth good unto him. The king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimahaz thy son, and Jonathan the son of Abiathar, See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness until there come word from you to certify me. Zadok therefore and Abiathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered, and he went barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went up. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount, where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city, and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now also be thy servant. Thou mayest, then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. And hast thou not there with thee Zadok and Abiathar the priests? Therefore it shall be that what thing soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimahaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them ye shall send unto me everything that ye can hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Amen. We know the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word for his name's sake. We're going to bow together in prayer and just ask the Lord for his blessing upon his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the reading of thy word today. And we know that there is a blessing in the reading of Holy Scripture. And we pray that thy truth will indeed enter into our hearts 
as we have read it, bless now our meditation upon the word of God. We need help from heaven. Pray for the help of the Holy Spirit, for direction from the Lord. And we pray that thou will take of the things of thyself today and use them as we ponder the truths that are set before us here in this chapter. We pray that the word of God will indeed be applied by the power of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, that thou will speak to us individually, personally, each one in our own lives, in our own experience and circumstances, in our own homes today. O Lord, come by. May we hear that still small voice of God saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. So grant us help, we pray now, in the preaching of thy word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to continue on today thinking about this theme of bringing the king back. We started it last Lord's Day morning uh, thinking about those words that are found uh, in this uh, portion of Second Samuel where there is that challenge about bringing the king back. And we want to think of some points out of this particular portion of scripture that we have read this morning. Now we thought about the rebellion led by Absalom and what that uh, meant in the life of David. Absalom had risen up against his father. He had formed a, an alliance with Ahithophel, uh, his father's counsellor. They were intent on slaying the king. It was only by king, uh, killing uh, king David that they could be sure of establishing themselves upon the throne. And the conspiracy was so strong that we read uh, of David having to leave the, the city of Jerusalem. He had to leave the royal palace and had to go out into the way of the wilderness as we read about it here in this particular uh, chapter. But why, what, what I want us to think upon this morning is the allegiance of those who were faithful to King David at that particular time. Because at that hour of rebellion and uprising in the nation of Israel, we read in this chapter of certain individuals whose allegiance to King David was unshakable. Unshakable. They were not ashamed to side with David. They were not ashamed to stand with the king at this particular time. They were not ashamed to declare which side that they were on. And it certainly was a day for taking sides and showing what side you were on because of what was happening with Absalom in, in the land and the conspiracy may indeed be strong against David, but these uh, men are going to remain faithful to him. There may be thousands who will be drawn to the side of Absalom, but nevertheless there's those who are going to stay with David. And their allegiance to David could not be called into question. The very opposite, because by their actions they show that they are indeed on David's side. And it is uh, that theme it's these individuals who were faithful to David that I want to draw your attention to this morning. And before we come on to think about uh, particular individuals and what we can glean from uh, what they say and what they did, I want you to be mindful of this particular point, that they were siding with King David in the hour of his rejection. They were siding with King David in the hour of his rejection. They, like others, could have taken stock. They could have considered the direction that the wind was blowing of public opinion at that particular time in the nation. They could have decided accordingly. They could have thought, well, it looks as if Absalom is gaining the upper hand. David has been on the throne for a long time and the people by their, by their thousands have, seems have turned away from David and they're following Absalom. They, they could have very easily decided, well, we'll go with the crowd. We'll just follow on with those hundreds and thousands of others who have turned to follow Absalom. And we'll leave David. We'll forsake David. But they didn't. In the hour of the king's rejection, they showed their alliance. They showed their, their allegiance. And they showed how faithful they were going to be to David. And surely that is worth noticing, that in this hour, in the hour of the king's rejection, was when they showed where their true allegiance was. It wasn't when everything was going well. It wasn't those times when David was on the throne. That's not what we're thinking about. We're thinking here now about David having to leave the city of Jerusalem. We're thinking about a conspiracy that is so strong against David at this particular time. But in this very hour, the hour of the king's rejection, these individuals show their allegiance. And they prove just how faithful they are to King David. And that's why we want to come to think 
about them this morning. And think about this theme of allegiance to the king. We were thinking last Lord's Day morning about the absence of the king and what that meant. Well, today I want us to think about the allegiance to the king that we all need to, to show and that we do need to show in the day of the king's rejection. Because as we were singing in that hymn, this is a day in which the Lord is rejected. Our Lord and Saviour, the King of Kings, is rejected in these times. He's not honoured as he ought to be honoured. He's not given his rightful place. There's not that respect and regard. There's not that fear for him that there ought to be in many hearts and in the land and in the nation uh, in a general way. There, there's not a regard given at all for, uh, to the Lord Jesus. This is the day of his rejection. But surely that's to be the very day when our allegiance is shown. But we de- de- determine that we're going to follow the Lord and that we show that to those around us, that we are indeed on the Lord's side and that we are unashamedly on the Lord's side. There are times when circumstances bring us to the place where we have to declare what side we are on. And surely we live in such a day when that that indeed needs to happen. We need to declare, well, what side are we on in these things? Are we on the Lord's side? Are we going to show allegiance to him? Are we going to be faithful to the Lord? While others may follow after whatever and and turn away from the Lord and follow many other things, are we going to be those who say, I profess to follow the Lord and I'm going to show that in my life? My allegiance is with the Lord because there are times and circumstances when it's going to, to call for us to declare which side we are indeed upon. And that's, that's brought out to us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's verse 19 of that chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 19. It might seem a very unusual verse, but it says, For there must be also heresies among you. That would seem a strange statement by Paul. There must be heresies. But that these are of necessity. Certainly we know that, that there are heresies that come and the Church of Jesus Christ have been, has been infected and afflicted with heresies of various sorts down through history. But Paul says here they must come. There, there's a necessity here. And then he goes on to explain uh, why this is the case. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Paul says, here's here's one of the benefits of heresy. Oftentimes, heresy troubles the church. When you think of some of those great heresies that have crept into uh, what was the professing church of Jesus Christ over the years and brought much trouble, turned many away from the truth according to godliness and turned them into another way, Ended taking them away from the truths, the foundational truths of the word of God. Heresies in many ways are are trouble. But here's Paul saying, in this way, it's a blessing. It's It's going to manifest certain things. It's going to manifest those who are approved, those who are on the Lord's side. It's going to have the the effect of, of filtering out. Individuals who are not on the Lord's side. That's one of the the matters always worth keeping in mind when you think about false teaching and heresies that are abroad in the world. And when they come, be very careful because it could be the means of filtering out just which side of the matter we're on. Are we on the Lord's side? Are we on the side of truth and righteousness? We could end up being on the wrong side. End up believing something, following someone, just because someone else said a particular thing and and our allegiance is with them. Never mind the truth of what they say or not. We're caught up and caught out on the wrong side. That can happen. But may our allegiance be with King Jesus. And that's what I want us to consider here out of this portion that we have been reading, 2 Samuel chapter 15. 
this allegiance to uh, the king. There, there's three sections that we're going to, to look at. First of all, we're going to think about the faithfulness of the king's servants. And if you come down there to verse 15, so it's 2 Samuel 15 and verse 15, and from there down to 18, you read about the king's servants. And they're individuals who certainly are showing their, their allegiance. They're, they're royal servants. They're called here the king's servants in verse 15. And you read something about them there in, in their connection in verse 18 with the Carathites and the Pelathites and the Gittites. But the servants are there. It says in verse 18, and all his servants passed on beside him. So there are these royal servants, royal servants, they, they describe themselves as, as such in verse uh, 15 because here they're, they're speaking collectively and it says there in verse 15, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Oh, they readily describe themselves as being servants and being royal servants at, at that. They were all too happy to be servants of the king. And there is surely a most basic point of application for us. Are we willing? Are we ready to be known and described as a servant of the king, that we belong to King Jesus, that we're one of his servants, we're one of his followers? Are we just as ready to do it as, as these individuals here are? All too happy to be described as such. No, oh, it's a sad day if we would want to be described in some other way rather than just a servant of the Lord. These are also unnamed servants. While we read, read of some others who are named in this particular chapter, these servants are not named. Their names are not given at this particular time. They, they are just described in this particular way as they are the servants of King David. Because it's not so much their names that are important. It's not their names that are important. It's their service. It tells us there in verse 18 that they passed on beside him. They're with David. They're alongside King David. That's what is important. It's David who is to have the preeminence in, in all of this. Not any, in, any one of these individual servants. There they are serving the, the king. There they are obedient to the king. And may that indeed be the case with us as well. That we might be the servants of the king the servants of the Lord Jesus, even unnamed servants. And there are many such in the world whose names will never be known. Their names are not household ones, but yet they faithfully follow the Lord and serve their Savior. And whether their name is known or not isn't important to them. They, they want Christ to have the preeminence. That's their desire. That's their longing. Was it individuals like that that Paul had in mind in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 15 and 16 when he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So Paul speaks here about the many in verse 16. As many as walk according to this rule. And there are many individuals who, who were faithful. The previous verse speaks about the work of regeneration. It's not outward circumcision that was required. Circumcision availeth nothing, as we know. It's the new creature. It's the work of regeneration in the heart that is important. And Paul is thinking about the many who have got that work of regeneration in their heart and who follow the Savior. And as, uh, he says about as many as walk according to this rule. And there are many indeed unnamed who are just like these servants of David who are faithful to their Lord and Master and who seek to serve him. You see their loyalty and their obedience is highlighted here in verse 15 because they say to David, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my Lord the King shall appoint. We're ready to do it. There isn't a corresponding verb in this uh, sentence or clause of this sentence that's why the words are in italics but the 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 thought is there there is the the thought of these individuals who who are ready to do whatever the king may appoint 
That's the measure of their allegiance to David. That's how loyal they are. Whatever the king will appoint, they will do. They will do David's bidding. He is but to command and they will obey. And that's why they pass on before him. That's why they're gathered around the king. As it tells you there in verse 18, also in chapter 16 and verse 6, we find some of these individuals as well around the king. It says there, speaking about Shimei, he cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. These servants were round about David, ready to do his bidding. Ready to do his bidding. How faithful and how loyal they were. And even there on that occasion in Second Samuel 16 and verse 6, they had the stones cast at them as well. Not only were they cast at David, but it says, and that all the servants of King David. So they were on the receiving end of those stones that were thrown by Shimei as he was venting his... Uh, frustration and dislike at King David. The servants were having to suffer that as well. Oh, they were loyal and obedient. And our loyalty to Christ, our obedience to Christ is to be exactly the same. We're told in John 15 verse 14, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Obedience, you see, is an essential part of allegiance. Allegiance to Christ requires obedience. We have to be willing to obey the Lord. We have to be willing to obey the Lord. And we have to be willing to obey him in the day of his rejection. And I wonder today, are, are, we, being, are we obedient? Can we take these words that are spoken here by the servants of David and use them with regards to ourselves and our obedience to Christ? Can we say, as in verse 15 there, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my Lord the King shall appoint. Are we, are we, are we ready to do that with regards to Jesus Christ? Or is there some matter that we're holding out against the Lord on? That we're not obey, obeying the Lord. We're not surrendering up our all. We don't have the spirit as was in these servants. Where we'll do whatever the Lord says on the matter. Oh I trust that the Lord might search your own hearts today. With even thought and regard to obedience. That we might have the spirit that was in these servants here. That are mentioned this particular point in, in, in this chapter. Now the second example that I want us to consider here is this man, Itai. And I want us to consider the fidelity of this man, Itai. We read about him there in verse 19. He, here's one of those individuals who is named. We've been thinking about those who are not named. But here's an individual who, who is named. And his resolve comes to the fore in the hour of the king's rejection. Because you have his words here in verse 21. He, he, he said to the king, As the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. So here's the resolve of this man, Ai. He, he, he reminds you something of Ruth. Remember what Ruth said to Naomi when she was seeking to persuade her to return to her own country and go back to her own gods? Ruth uttered words. We'll come to think about them just in a, a little moment or, or two. But there's surely something very similar here to uh, the words of, of Idai that you have in the book of Ruth. That Ruth spoke on that particular occasion. It's interesting to, note, to notice that David sought to dissuade Idai from going with the king. If you come back there to um, those verse 20 it is. Well, verse 21 we better, uh, verse 19 it says, Then said the king to Idai the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. And whereas thou camest but yesterday, 
Should I this day make thee go up and down, with a scene I go whither I may, return thou and take back thy brethren, mercy and truth be with thee. So the king is, <coughs> is seeking to dissuade him. Now was that to draw out from it the measure of this man's allegiance? Was that what David was intending here? Was, was there an opportunity here presented to it to draw back? The king seems to be opening the door of opportunity for Ittai to do that. So what's he going to do? Here, here's the opportunity. He, he could readily agree with the king and say, okay, I will indeed return. You think I'm going to be a burden to you there as it is described in uh, those, those verses? I, I'll just go back as you suggest. There was already a ready at hand excuse. David mentions a number of factors there in, in verses 19 and 20. You're a stranger, you're an exile, you've only come but yesterday. There, there's, there's sufficient excuse for any one of them, even all of them all together, certainly. They could be taken as, a, as an excuse for not going on with David. Idei was a, a proselyte from among the Philistines. He's, he's the Gittite. So it indicates to us that that he's a proselyte from among the Philistines. So that this man could have had any number of reasons for not going on with David that day. And for readily agreeing with the king and saying, you're right, I'll, I'll go back. I'll take the opportunity and go back. But that's not the spirit that was in Eddie. He didn't look for the opportunity. He didn't look for the excuse. Not to go on with the king. Not to show which side he was on. If he was faithful, David didn't want to expose him to danger. And in that regard, David was was again offering him a, a halfway house. He could pledge his allegiance to the king, but not go over with the king. Not side with the king. Not stand with the king in the day of his rejection. But it seems as if Etai has been brought to that place where he's put on the spot. What's he going to do? He's going to have to make up his mind. There's excuses that are are presented to him even by the king. There's there's reason for him to say any one of these things is, is cause to go back. It seems as if the king has put him on the spot in a sense. What's he going to do? Well, we know what he's going to do because we have his words here in, in verse 21. Oh, he's determined what he's going to do. But are there not times when we are in the same position and the question would come to us, what are we going to do? The same scenario exists today in many regards. You can have a halfway house allegiance to Christ. You can have a halfway house allegiance to Christ. You're for the Lord in name, but... Not in conduct. You're for the Lord in words. Oh, we can, we can do that. We can take the name. We can have the words. They cross our lips. We, we can have allegiance to Christ in, in that regard. We take a name. We, we utter words. But is that just a halfway house allegiance? What about the fidelity of Etai? Here's a man and with him there's no going back. There's no halfway house. It's all or nothing with regards to this man, Idai. It's all or nothing. He, he's going to stand with the king. He's going to identify with the king. He wants to go on with the king. The king's going to have to pass over. It tells us as you uh, work your way down through these, these verses in this chapter how David's going to have to pass over the the, the the brook and go over out into the, the wilderness. But Etai is determined that he's going to stand with David. He's not going to leave the side of the king. He says to David, whether it's in life or death, whether it's in safety or in time of peril, I'm going to be at your side. I'm going to be at your side. Verse 21 says that, Surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also will thy servant be. So in whatever circumstances, 
Edei is resolved that he is going to be at the side of David. Now here's fidelity indeed. And may it be reflected in, in our lives. May it be reflected in our lives with regards to our allegiance to Christ. That is not a name we take upon ourselves. It's not even words that we speak. It's seen in, in our conduct. We're going to be at the king's side. We're going to stand for the Lord. We're going to be clearly identified as being on the Lord's side. Even in the day of his rejection. And that brings us to go back to think about those words that are spoken of with regards to Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1 and it's verse 15 where Naomi said to her, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after my sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. That was the resolve that was on the part of Ruth. May it be a resolve that's on the, our part. May we be like Ruth and may we be like Edei. These individuals who had a resolve, whether in death or life, they're going to stand with Christ. No, oh, may, we, may we be such. The, these are the only spoken words of Edei that you can find in the Bible, as far as I can see. I might be wrong, but I can't find any other words that are attributed to this man in uh, the word of God. He, he doesn't seem to be a man of many words. Very opposite. He seems to be a man of more, more of determined action. He knew his mind and he stuck to it no matter what. This is possibly why he, he rose to a position of, of being a commander in, in David's army. The Gittites are mentioned there as, as belonging to David and following David. There's the Carathites, the Pelathites, and the Gittites. But this man went on to, to be one of the, the, the commanders in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And verse 2 it says, David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Etai, the Gittite. So there are these three commanders in Israel, Joab, Abishai, and this man, Etai. And here he is, rising to this this position where he's one of three commanders in David's army has it to do with his resolve that we read off here in this portion of scripture that he's a man of few words but of steadfast resolve he knows his own mind there's a firmness about his allegiance to King David and can the same be said of you and me? Is there a firmness about our allegiance to Christ? Do we know our mind? Do we know our own mind? Are we those who know what we ought to do and who do it? That we're going to stand our ground? We're not going to be carried away by, by the crowd and what they think? But rather we're, we're going to stand. We're going to honour the Lord. We're going to be on the side of Christ. Oh, here's allegiance, as is illustrated in the life of Edei. And may it indeed be seen in our lives as well. There's one further individual here that I want us uh, to consider, and it's this man, um, Hushai, that you read off further on down uh, the chapter, beginning verse 32, came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount, where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his, his head. And from there down to the end of the chapter, you find uh, mention made of this man, Hushai. And what you have here is the fruitfulness of this man in his allegiance to King David. The fruitfulness of this man because of what is said about him. It's not so much 
again what place he is from, although that place is twice described there. He's, he's the archite. But I want you to notice that far more importantly in this portion, he's described as David's friend. David's friend. Verse 37, it says, So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. And then if you come into the next chapter as well, it continues this um, account of, of these developments that were taking place at that particular time. So it's chapter 16 and verse 16. It came to pass when Hushai the archite, David's friend, was come to, unto Absalom. That Hushai said unto Absalom, God save the king, God save the king. So twice over here, he's described as David's friend. He seems to be one of David's counsellors as well. Hithophel was one of those counsellors. But Hushai seems to be one of those counsellors uh, as well. But here's a man who is described as David's friend. David's confident. Because the, the word has the idea of a, of a special friend. It's not the normal word for friend that you would have in the Old Testament language. This is, this is a word that only appears a, a, a few times. Only appears a, a few times. And here's, here's where it is used. These two occasions in verse 37 of chapter 15 and then verse 16 of chapter 16. And it's referring to a special friend. A true friend. Not, not just a casual friend. Oh, this was more than an ordinary friend. Here, here was a special friend. Here was a confidant. Here was somebody who David could confide in. Here's somebody who David could trust. That's the type of man that Hushai is. Now, David didn't have many friends that day. Oh, they've turned away from David by the hundreds and by the thousands. There's only a few who were his friends. And here's one of them, this man, Hushai, David's friend, David's special friend, David's close friend. There were times before that, that David had individuals who were close to him. Think of Jonathan. But Jonathan has been dead for some time, as we know. But here's another man who is close to David now. And he's called David's friend. And there is allegiance on his part. And here's, here's the terms upon which it is. It's on the terms of friendship. It's on the terms of, of friendship, even special friendship. Is our allegiance to Christ on those terms? It's, it's not some dry allegiance. It's not some sense of that we have no other option, we're driven to this. That's not the, the type of spirit that the Christian is to have in allegiance to Christ. No, it's to be on the terms of friendship. It's to be on the terms even of special friendship. Because the one whom we serve is the one who is the friend of sinners. He's the friend of sinners. He's the one who loved our souls. Jesus Christ gave himself for his people. He loves them dearly. He loved them unto death. Having loved his own, he loved them unto the end, and the end was a cruel death. And surely our allegiance to, to Jesus Christ has to be on the same basis as Hushai's friendship with David. There, there's, there's an allegiance here, but it's on this basis of friendship. And may we too have that true friendship with Christ. May we know him as a friend of sinners. Do you know him today in that way? Maybe you're listening in today and you don't know Christ at all. You're a stranger to Christ. Those words that we were thinking earlier with regard to it, I, a stranger in an exile, could well describe you and, and your spiritual state. You're a stranger to grace and to God. You're an exile among his people. You don't know the Lord. You don't know him as the friend of sinners. Well, you can discover Christ as the friend of sinners. He's the friend of sinners. He is the one of whom it is said, this man receive a sinful man. He receives sinners. He's the friend of sinners. 
He died to save sinners. And you can know him as the friend of sinners. He's the one who befriends sinners. He loves them. He saves them. And may we indeed have such a, an allegiance to Christ based upon this great truth of Christ, the friend of sinners. May that underpin our, our allegiance. You know, John the Baptist was called the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. But John the Baptist, he said himself that he was not the bridegroom, but he was the friend of the bridegroom. We might know it today as the best man. But John the Baptist was somebody who was called, in John 3, verse 29, the friend of the bridegroom. And remember what, what John desired? John said that he might increase and that I might decrease. There was allegiance to Jesus Christ in John's part. That Jesus Christ might ever be increasing. And that John would ever be decreasing. He wasn't interested in himself. It wasn't about the promotion of himself. Not at all. Not at all. Rather it was the exaltation, the increase of Jesus Christ. That's what was important. Abraham was known as the friend of God in the Bible. Three times that is said, twice in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament. James mentions it, James 2.23, that Abraham was known as the friend of God. And James is there referring to what is told to us in the, in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles 20 verse 7, Isaiah 41 verse 8. In those two portions it tells us Abraham was the friend of God. And what allegiance Abraham showed to the Lord. He was willing to obey the Lord. Set out for a land. He didn't know where he was going, but he obeyed the Lord. He offered Isaac, or he was going to offer Isaac upon the altar until the Lord called upon him to stop and the ram was substituted for Isaac. No, Abraham had allegiance to the Lord. Do we have allegiance to Christ today? Is it based upon friendship? Christ is the friend of sinners. But it tells you here that Hushai came to David with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. He, he came in the appearance of the mourner. Hushai uh, mourned over the fact that David had been conspired against, that he had been overthrown, that he was no longer upon the throne and had to leave the city of, of Jerusalem. These all these things all saddened him immensely. He, he was a broken man over these things. And it tells you there in verse the end of verse 32 that he came to meet David with his coat rent and earth upon his head. Does it trouble us when Christ is not honoured? Does that grieve us immensely? Or are we happy to live with the breaking of the laws of God in this land and in our nation? And it doesn't really concern us or trouble us. Ought we not to be concerned? Ought we not to have the spirit of the mourner? Even in these times, should we not be like Jeremiah who wept over the people and their disobedience of the Lord? Here, here's the spirit that's in Hushai. Here, here's what it is to have allegiance and the allegiance to Christ ought also to show us something of the spirit of the mourner. But Hushai was commis commissioned to render a particular service to David. David says to go back into the city and seek to defeat the, the, the council of Ahithophel. This man could dissuade Absalom from following the advice that would be given or he could relay it to David. There were helpers, Zadok and Abiathar and their two uh, sons are mentioned here in this portion as well as those who could help in this, this matter. So this man was, was commissioned to, to do a particular thing. Matthew Henry said in this portion, It is good service to countermine the policy of the church's enemies. It is good service to countermine the policy of the kings of the church's enemies. I wonder today, do we do such a thing? Are we for all that God is for or are we against all that God is against? 
Are we always seeking to undermine Christ's enemies? Are we always working against them, standing against them, seeking to resist them? This is the measure of allegiance to, to the king. May indeed we show that allegiance in our own hearts, and our own lives. Even as we come to a close just now, may we be those who are always working for the king of glory against his enemies, seeking to advance his cause. And this man Hushai rendered valuable service, as these chapters go on to tell us. And may we so serve our King and show our allegiance to him. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts for his name's sake. Amen. Well, we're going to close with one final hymn. It's 343. It says, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. 343, the words will come up on the screen. Please join in. Father, we do commit our way to thee, asking thee to bless thy word today that we have considered, write it upon every heart. Grant us thy blessing, we ask of thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for joining with us this morning on our broadcast. If we can be of any help and counsel uh, to you, uh, then uh, do contact us. There will be details that will come up on the screen. Uh, may the Lord bless his word to your heart today. And, and may we indeed be those that show our allegiance to Jesus Christ in these days. The Lord bless.